Hi, good afternoon everyone. So now we are going to discuss the abdominal cavity. Okay, this is the first lecture of the series and I'm not going to bombard you with a lot of information. We're going to keep it very simple. I'm just going to briefly introduce you to what exactly is the abdominal region. Now the best way to approach the abdominal region would be from the anterior side as you would do when you're dissecting it in your dissection hall, right? So the first thing you're going to see is the skin, right? And when we discuss the skin, we have to speak about the dermatomal distribution in this area, which will not be discussed here, it will be discussed in a dissection hall practically. So we're going to keep it out of the discussion for now. After skin, you have the superficial and the deep fascia, which we'll discuss in detail in the dissection hall. And then you're going to start seeing the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. When you cut open the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall, you're going to see something that is known as the parietal peritoneum. Once you cut that open, you're going to get inside the peritoneal cavity. And then the part that is lining all the abdominal organs is the visceral peritoneum. So these are all the layers that you have to traverse before you actually enter an abdominal organ. Okay? So let's try to familiarize ourselves with the abdominal cavity first, okay? Introduction to the abdominal cavity and the peritoneum. That is our topic for today. Let's first start talking a little bit about the abdominal cavity. Now it's obviously a cavity, but the best way to describe it would be to imagine an oval balloon, okay? So I'm going to kind of draw like a vertical capsule shaped balloon over here. Right? The balloon has a roof. The roof is contributed by the diaphragm. Just think of it as a dome shaped umbrella. It actually has a left and right cupola. So it actually has a different structure. But what I'm drawing right now is a schematic representation just to understand the general structure of the abdominal cavity. So think of this as the diaphragm. Okay? To be more precise, it's known as the thoracoabdominal diaphragm. Okay? Then the floor is essentially just continuing into a smaller cavity that is known as the pelvic cavity. Okay? Now again, we're not going to discuss too much about the pelvic cavity here, but just remember that it is present within the bony pelvis. So you have the true bony pelvis the false bony pelvis and all those details which are not important for now. But just remember that the abdominal cavity continues downwards into the pelvic cavity. Then let's discuss the posterior wall. Now the posterior wall is contributed mostly by the lumbar vertebrae. Okay, so I'm going to draw a little bit of T12 here. L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, and then you have the sacral. Okay, now the sacral promontory is going to contribute to the posterior aspect of the pelvic cavity. I'm going to slightly modify my diagram. I'm sorry about that. Something like this. Okay, so that's your sacral. Schematic. Don't draw it like this. Okay, so that's your L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. Posterior wall on the midline is contributed by the lumbar vertebrae. Then on the left side of the midline, you have the abdominal aorta. Okay. Somewhere over here is going to bifurcate. And on the right side, you have the inferior renal tower. Okay. And then on either side of the midline, you have certain muscles. One of them is the psoas major, which has attachment on the lateral processes, or the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae. It will be going something like this. Right? This is your psoas major. And then lateral that you have another quadrilateral muscle, which is known as the quadratus lumborum. Oops, the quadratus lumbar, and then the lateral wall you have the abdominal muscles which we shall discuss soon. Okay, and then there's a fascia, known as a thoracolumbar fascia, 
there are other facial sleeves here okay if you go below you have the iliac crest somewhere over here and there's another muscle that is contributed from the iliac crest that is known as the iliacus so that essentially contributes to more the pelvic cavity right So that's your posterior wall. Now let's talk about the lateral wall. The lateral wall is contributed by three abdominal muscles. From outside within these are let's assume this line to be the mid axillary line. I'm sure you already know what that is. And from outside within, the first muscle fibers forming the lateral wall are going downwards and medially and this is the external oblique now if you remove the external oblique the next muscle that you will see will have fibers exactly in the opposite direction as that of external oblique these are the fibers of the internal oblique and finally when you also remove this muscle the last muscle that you will see will be having transverse fibers and this one is known as the transversus abdominis. The lateral wall is contributed from outside within by the external oblique, fibers going downwards immediately, the internal oblique, fibers exactly perpendicular to that and then inside of that the transversus abdominis. Okay, three muscles. Again, as these muscles start coming anteriorly, they form a flat tendon that is known as an aponeurosis. So you've got the aponeurosis of each of these three muscles and then they blend with each other and fuse and uh, develop into certain layers and all of these form the anterior abdominal wall and this is known as the rectus sheet and inside the rectus sheet you have a vertical segmented strap muscle on either side of the midline and that is known as your rectus abdominis. So if I were to draw that, I would draw it somewhere over here. You know what that is, that's basically what you call the abs, right? I'm sure you guys have seen the abs before. This is what that muscle looks like. There's a rectus sheath covering it. There's a fibrous tissue in between, in between both these on either side. which is known as the linea alba. So we're not going to discuss more of details on the anterior abdominal wall right now. But here's your general orientation of the abdomen. Posterior wall formed by the five lumbar vertebrae. Just in front of that, on the left side, you have the abdominal aorta. On the right side, you have the inferior vena cava. On either side, you have the muscles from medial to lateral. These are the psoas muscle, lateral to which is the quadratus lumborum, lateral to which your lateral wall has already started forming. The lateral wall is contributed from outside within by the external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis, while the anterior wall is contributed by the segmented rectus abdominis which is embedded inside the rectus sheath which is contributed by the aponeurosis of the three lateral muscles okay okay so now let's discuss the quadrants of the abdomen in order to have a general map of the abdominal cavity in a two-dimensional format the abdomen is best divided into nine regions by four lines okay so I am just going to start from the posterior wall and draw a schematic diagram of the T12, L1, L2, L3, L4 and L5 vertebrae. Okay. This could be the sacrum. This is where the pelvis is beginning. So I am going to use this part and this is somewhere where the diaphragm is inserted, the posterior aspect of the diaphragm, the left and the right over. So, let's see how we divide these quadrants, okay? The first line that I'm going to draw is the horizontal line passing from the lower border of L1 border, okay? lower border of L1 this is known as the trans pyloric plane it is also known as the plane of Addison okay the trans pyloric plane of Addison 
Now, the next line that I'm going to draw the horizontal line that is going to be passing from the upper border of L5 vertebra. Okay, this is also known as the trans tubercular line. And this is because it passes through the iliac tubercles. Now, I don't know if you remember the hip bone, but the iliac tubercle is present approximately 5 centimeters behind the anterior superior iliac spine. So, imagine this is the sacral promontory. I'm just going to construct a schematic iliac crest over here on either side. And that, somewhere over here, is going to be your anterior superior iliac spine. 5 centimeters behind that, you have a bit of tubercle popping on the lateral border of the iliac crest, and that is your iliac tubercle. So that's plane number two, the trans tubercular plane. Now we are also going to start using two vertical lines, and these are just going to be the mid clavicular lines on either side. Let me just make that a little bit more straight for you. Right. So assuming that this is T12, we probably got T1 somewhere over there. I'm sure I'm out of frame right now. We've got two clavicles and somewhere coming from the midpoint of the clavicle is going to be your mid-clavicular line. Another way to construct it would be by finding the mid invinal point that would be somewhere over here. The midpoint of a line considered from the pubic semi-pisis to the anterior superior iliac spine. So somewhere over here. Let's construct that upwards and you have your left-sided mid-clavicular line. I understand you are seeing it from the anterior side, so this is the left side and this is the right side of the body. Something very similar here. Over here. Okay. That's your right mid-clavicular line. Now you have the nine quadrants of the abdomen, right? Now having a mapping or a two-dimensional format of the abdominal wall as such gives you a basic idea of where exactly the organs can roughly be supposed to lie and that is a very important thing that you can use when you are describing any abdominal organ in its introduction or its location right let's check out the names of the quadrants okay i'm going to start from the center this is the umbilical quadrant The umbilicus would lie somewhere in between the levels of L3 and L4, so it would lie somewhere in the middle in the middle line. That's another important landmark which we talk about in the angry abdominal wall. Then on either side we have the left and the right lumbar quadrants. Okay, it's the umbilical quadrant. Then Above the umbilicus, you have the epigastric quadrant. Below the umbilical region, you have the hypogastric quadrant. Now, this should already try to make you understand that most of the stomach lies in the umbilical quadrant. So, you've got the epigastric above the stomach and the hypogastric below the stomach. Now, on either side of the epigastric, we have the right. Sorry, the left and the right hypochondrium. And on either side of the hypogastric, you have the left and the right iliac fossa. And as you can see, the iliac fossa is right here. The muscle that is coming from the iliac fossa is the muscle known as iliacus, which will be discussed in pelvis, right? So you have got the left and the right iliac fossa. So that's the nine quadrants of your abdomen. Let's start from the center, that's the umbilical. On the left is left lumbar, on the right is right lumbar. At the top you have the epigastric, on the left of which is the left hypochondrium, on the right of which is the right hypochondrium. In the hypogastric, on the left side we have the left iliac fossa, on the right side we have the right iliac fossa. 
Now the cool thing about knowing the abdominal quadrants is having a brief idea of the rough disposition of the abdominal viscera. It could just give you a rough idea of where exactly things lie and you could obviously use vertebral levels and some other vertical lines which can make the location even more precise. Let me give you an example. This is known as the transpyloric plane of Addison, right? This is because the pylorus is present at the level of L1. Okay? So we know that it's present somewhere around this line. Great? Now, to find out a vertical line, to further pinpoint it, we do know that the pylorus lies about 1.25 centimeters roughly on the right side of the midline. So if this is the midline here, so if I go 1.25 centimeters over here on the right side of the midline and the transpyloric plane, this is the region where the pylorus is present. Similarly, we know where the gastric, the cardiac end of the stomach is, and this kind of information we can use in doing the surface marking of these organs, and that will obviously help in certain intervention procedures or to localize certain kinds of tenderness, etc. etc. Right? So the pylorus is here, and the stomach roughly lies something like this, so it occupies a part of the umbilical region, a part of the left lumbar region and also a part of the left hypothalamus. There you go, that's your beautiful stomach and that's how you figure out where the stomach is. There's a couple of other things that lie at the level of L1, uh, the right and the left kidney, the hilum region, that's slightly in a more posterior plane. We've got the fundus of the gallbladder, we've got the neck of the pancreas. So I'm not going to get into details of all these things at this stage, but I just want you to know how important it is to understand the quadrants of the abdomen. And when you're describing any abdominal organ, as we shall now see in the pro forma, you always talk about the quadrants very early in your answer, just so that you have a rough idea of where exactly it is located. Okay? Okay, now is when we reach the most interesting aspect of the lecture. And that is going to be the discussion of the peritoneum. Now peritoneum is going to be dealt in detail in a completely separate lecture. So what I'm going to tell you in the next 10 minutes is just a brief understanding of what exactly is the peritoneum and the peritoneal cavity. Okay? So we've already established that the abdomen is like an oval balloon, right? He's going to cut off this part of the balloon, okay? The top half, I'm just going to cut it off. Now, like I said, there is a balloon inside the balloon, so let's use the green shop for the inside balloon, right? So this is the inside balloon. Okay? Great. This is cool. Okay? Now, any organ that is present in the abdomen is not really puncturing this balloon but is just an invagination into this balloon. That's where we use the punching theory. So I'm just going to punch this balloon inside but making sure that I do not burst it open. And when that happens, this kind of a shape is created, right? And I'm going to drop my hand or the fist with a white chalk. Great. So, with this theory, the balloon is not bursting, but the organ is now surrounded by the balloon everywhere, very closely adhered to it, and that part, my friends, is known as the visceral peritoneum, the part of the peritoneum that is very firmly adherent to the abdominal organ is the visceral peritoneum. Okay? So every time you see an organ, you'll actually see a glistening, uh, I, for lack of a better word, plastic film like thing on your organ, and that is going to be the visceral peritoneum. There are certain regions where you won't see that. It will be less glistening, less shiny. That is the part that is not lined by peritoneum. This, my friends, is known as the bare area. What is it known as? The bare area. You will see a couple of bare area, especially in the liver. The part of the organ that does not have the visceral peritoneum lining on it. Now, in 
the current situation if i use the color blue for the organ and if the organ is something like this and you see this much part this much part of the organ is not going to have visceral peritoneum and that is the bare area of the organ and since every organ is going to need nutrition the blood supply the nerve supply the lymphatic drainage etc etc of all this organ needs to enter and this seems like the only route through which all these things can enter inside right so technically it seems that the vessels arteries veins the nerves the lymphatics they all seem to be a content of a double fold of peritoneum right this double fold of peritoneum is usually given the prefix meso like suppose this was the appendix i would call this meso appendix if this was a part of the intestine i would call it meso intestine now another word for intestine is enteric gastroenteric system you know what i'm saying so mesentery If this was a duodenum, I'd call it meso duodenum. So I hope you understand what the concept of a meso is. It is nothing but a double fold of peritoneum, which carries all the blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerve supply to the organ. Okay. So we've got the visceral peritoneum lining the organ, the meso prefix added to whatever organ that is carrying all the blood supply within its two folds, and the part of the organ that is now facing this. meso structure is the bare area and whatever else is adherent to the abdominal wall is the parietal peritoneum okay so please take a note of this we've got the organ the visceral peritoneum the bare area the double fold of peritoneum that is known as a meso and then the name of whatever organ eventually in certain places we just use the word ligament we just call it a ligament especially in case of the liver we've got the falciform ligament we've got the hepato duodenal ligament we've got the gastrosplenic ligament these are just double folds of peritoneum between two organs and they are connected to each other do you get that okay great now i could probably draw a couple more organs over here and the same structure will be maintained so i'm just going to quickly draw another organ i'm going to put a punch from here shin okay so you have this double fold and what color am i using here visceral peritoneum and the organ that i'm going to draw in blue and the blood supply that is going to come venous drainage lymphatics etc etc okay we are going to be studying a lot of such structures throughout the peritoneum as well as when we talk about the peritoneal relations of the organs so right now i just want you to map them up and peritoneum is mostly going to be the last lecture in this series so you have to map all these structures and then eventually we are going to start understanding all these things when we start revising the entire series again okay to make things a little more interesting i'm going to slightly delve into a little bit of embryology okay now i hope you've uh, checked out my general embryology series it probably must be out on youtube by now look it up uh, it's called general embryology and uh, in that i have explained general embryology in quick 20 minute lectures 10 of them so i'm just going to take you back to the third week of embryogenesis and draw the tall column my ectoderm and the low cuboidal endoderm this is the bilaminar germ disk eventually during the third week the third layer is already come after the primitive tree that's your intraembryonic mesoderm that i'm drawing in green right in the center there appears a structure only to disappear later that's your notochord eventually the notochord disappears but after that there is classification of the intraembryonic mesoderm into three different structures known as the paraxial mesoderm the intermediate mesoderm and finally the lateral plate mesoderm then eventually a cavity arises in the lateral plate mesoderm this is the cavity this is known as the intraembryonic seal okay intraembryonic seal am i correct to spell it right i think so 
right? In Trendyonic serum. And eventually, during the fourth week when there is folding, all this is going to connect to each other like this. So the intraembryonic coelom now forms what is known as the peritoneal cavity. Okay? That is nothing but the air inside this balloon. So if I just cut off a little small square and go inside this balloon, that cavity in which my hand is going to be is the peritoneal cavity. This is the representation of that in the embryological period. This is the fetal cavity. Okay? Now as the lateral folding occurs, this will also fold, but what we are interested in is the folding of the endoderm to form what is known as the primitive gut tube. And eventually, this ends up coming slightly anteriorly, so I'm going to draw it here. Right? And this entire intraembryonic mesoderm.
in the double fold. Let's just call it the mesentery right now. A better word would be the dorsal mesentery since it's coming from the dorsal side. And this is the ventral or anterior branch of the dorsal aorta or abdominal aorta that's going to end up supplying this gut wall. So this is a typical schema of the blood supply of the developing intestine or a developing gut which is obviously retained in adult life as well. Okay? These are known as the ventral branches of the abdominal aorta. You have the artery of foregut, the artery of the midgut and the artery of the hindgut which we shall study in systemic embryology. That's how the GID or the gastrointestinal tract derives its blood supply. That's the general schema of things. So I need you to take three points home from the introduction to the peritoneal cavity part of this lecture. Point number one, the peritoneum is a smaller balloon inside the bigger balloon that is the abdominal cavity. The balloon is never pierced or punctured. It is just displaced and that's how the viscera arrange themselves while they do so. The part that closely sticks to the viscera is the visceral peritoneum. The part that is closely adhering to the body wall is the parietal peritoneum and the double fold that is formed as these viscera invaginate into the peritoneum is known as the double fold and you can call it meso this, meso that, in this case the mesentery, we are calling this the dorsal mesentery. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, please post them in the comment section. I'll see you in the next lecture.